Okay, we are live. I didn't even check audio. It looks like it's working though. Wow, I'm on a roll. Let me know if you guys can hear me before we get started. I'm watching my computer that has the reference photo decided to restart. Or no, sorry, update. Thank you, Windows. I told you not to update and it was like, yeah, no, screw you, I'm gonna do it anyway. Yay, Windows. Also, I sound like a frog because I was sick all weekend. Totally better now. My allergies are through the roof. So, you know, got a double whammy there. I'm no longer sick, but I still sound a bit like a frog. So, or less like a chipmunk. I think somebody once said I sounded like a chipmunk on crack. Thanks for the comment but I'll never forget it and it's hilarious and my husband still makes fun of me for that one. So come on, log, get going computer. Also, before we start, we had a super chat. Um, did, are you guys, oh, the boys, Gibson's not totally paying attention. There's a super chat, Gibson. Uh, Jael, thank you so much for the super chat. She had said, thank you for these live paintings, yay. So the boys get a treat because that's how we're starting off. Oh, you guys figured it out already, huh? while we wait for my computer to restart. This was perfect timing. You give us something to do while we wait for, it says just a moment, we'll see. Okay, back up, back up. Good boys. Thank you for biting my fingers again, Wade. You're so bad about that. And of course, Gibson's gotta take it to his bed. Okay, Wade, go lay down. Go lay down, lay down. That was it, lay down. See, thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's actually what I was doing. I set it to that, it froze up, caused an issue. It looks like it's up, so let's, rem no, I'm not gonna set up your little whatever. And now I've gotta pull my reference photo back up. We will get started in just a moment here. Okay, that actually wasn't as big of a drama as I thought it was gonna be, because about two minutes before the live stream started, it started the update, and sometimes those can take like an hour. So yeah, I've been putting it off forever. Like every time I come in and open that, because I don't go online with that computer, it's only for my reference photos. So it's like, I'm not dealing with your update right now. And yeah, <coughs> okay. Got my reference photo over there. So tonight we are going to be working in watercolor first for the underpainting and then we're gonna go over on top with colored pencil. This is going to be Ladybug on a white daisy requested. I forget who requested it last week. Uh, good, you can hear fine, everything's good. Um, oh, camera. Let's change the camera angle. Let's start that again. Tonight we are going to be working in watercolor and going over that for detail with colored pencil. I am working on Arches Hot Press 140 pound watercolor paper. I've got this taped to my board with a acid free pH neutral masking tape. Now I do wanna throw out there the masking tape that I've been linking forever. They changed the description on Amazon and it no longer says that it's pH neutral. I don't know if it really is or not anymore. The one that you want should have this inside. Let me grab, come on. It actually says, you can see the pro premium pH neutral. It'll say, so if you've got one and it says pH neutral, I'm sure it's okay. And I don't know if the new one is still pH neutral, like why it changed. I should probably just order one and see what it looks like. But just be aware of that. I think Jerry's Artorama was the other place that I've gotten pH neutral masking tape. So that's somewhere else you can look if you can't find it. So um, yeah, and does it still say Nick? Let me look. Let's click the link. Um, it just says artist. Okay, so that, yeah, it says acid free, so it's good. It's expensive, jeez. That is not how, that's like twice as much as what I normally pay. So check out, I would definitely check out Amazon, or not Amazon, um, Jerry's. I mean, if I have to pay that much, I would. I just never have. Normally, I pay about half that. So maybe a little bit more than half, but that's, yeah. So anyway, um, I'm glad that at least there is one that is listed as acid free. I'm just kind of surprised at the price of them. Check Jerry's, I would definitely check Jerry's because if you're gonna order enough from Jerry's anyway to get free shipping, then it may be worth doing that. Go for the deal. Okay, um, thank you again, JL, the boys. Thank you for their, their I'm not gonna say the word because I think Gibson learned what super C-H-A-T means, that dogs have, Freaking genius over there. Okay, so let me adjust my lighting. This is not, oops. There we go. That's a bit better. It's really, why is it so dark? Hold on, I need to adjust this camera. We're gonna get started in just a second here. I, this is just, um, 
nope, that's not the one that I need. I need, not Stream Deck, Camera Hub. So that is the Elgato. Hopefully it doesn't make anything freeze up, but that exposure is really dark. Let me just Actually, I think I just put that on the wrong. That may have been the one for the boys. I think it's this one. I don't know which one I'm messing with. Um, yep, that's the one. Okay. Probably. Huh. It's not doing really what I want it to do. I'm sorry to mess with this right now that I didn't realize how bad it was. It's gonna adjust because it was daylight in here just like five minutes ago and now it's getting like quickly got dark. So it is being interesting. And maybe that is not the way that I'm going to fix that. Let me try one more way to fix this and otherwise it just looks dark and we're gonna deal with that. Um, I promise we're going to get going in just a moment. If you have questions, go ahead and leave them now. I'll be answering those at the end of the stream once I get the project done. Uh, project, here we go. Configure video. Brightness. Yeah, that should help. I may have to adjust this again once um, we get going a bit more. Or maybe not just brightness. Maybe that's not what I want to do. I'm just going to hit all the buttons until something happens. Oh, well, it looks about right. Too much. Too much. Too much. Like it's, there's not really a good, that's about as close as I think we're going to get for now. I don't know. We're going to, we're going to go with it. Let's see how, what happens. Um, kind of better. I should have fixed that earlier. Anyway. Okay. Oh, we got another super chat from Tessa already. <laughs> this is treat time. Oh, look. <laughs> I, all I had to say is Tessa and the boys are both already here. Okay. I guess we're going to have all the treats tonight. Yeah. Spoiled much. I'm going to have to get a new bag of these treats soon. Say thank you, Tessa. Back up. Back up. Back up. Yeah. There we go. There's your coach faces. Good boys. Okay, go lay down. You better go get the bed without the toy fast, Gibson, before brother gets it. Go lay down. There's no more. Lay down. Lay down, pushy boys. Hey, go lay down. Getting a little spoiled there. Uh-oh, Gibson's not going to want to lay down because there's a bed and a toy in that bed. I'll move it. Let me get the scary dinosaur out for you, drama queen. He won't lay in a bed if there's a toy in it, even if he's the one who put the toy in it. Don't understand. Okay, let's, come on, get that out of the way. Okay. Let's go ahead. I've got the camera right. Make sure I got everything where it's supposed to be. We can start painting. So tonight I am still working and no, Angela, I have not yet used the Daniel Smith. I need to, but these are the Schmincke watercolors. They, I've got a list here of the way that my colors are set up in my pan. So I can easily look and see which color that I want. Um, actually, I'm missing one of my pans too. There we go. And if you are interested in bidding on this one, you can head over to my website. Link is in the video description. And once I get going, if you think you want this in your house, it is a five by seven. It will come matted. That will be available. I think the starting bid is, <coughs> sorry, $55. No, I won't cost all over yours. At least the, I'm not sick anymore. There aren't germs. It's just between allergies and remnants of last weekend. Okay, moving on. No one cares. Let's get started. So I'm going to start with the blue background and my computer is popping up things I don't want to see. This is probably going to happen a bit tonight. No, I don't care about webcam shield. I'm not even online on that. No, I am online on that computer. Okay. So with the background, it doesn't really matter what color you go with. I just want, I'm going with blue. My original, the reference photo is green. So interesting fact. And I've realized this on the two paintings I did that were primarily green, there wasn't as much demand or excitement for those paintings. Now maybe people just didn't like that style. I like green, so I see green, I'm like, oh, that goes with my decor. 
But I remembered what I was like, how odd that those were the two that weren't as popular with the auctions. And it could have just been that night. It could have been that people weren't like just drawn to those subjects. But when I worked at Let's Art Party, the lady, it, that was one of those places where you would drink wine while um, painting. I used to teach one of the classes at the one, one of them. And the lady who owned it told us that there were, they had done studies and such, and a lot of galleries would not bring in paintings that were primarily green because they just didn't sell. For some reason, people don't aren't as excited to buy green paintings. So for those of you looking to paint something that sells, kind of an interesting thing. And I thought that was odd that the two for me that didn't do as well were primarily green, which again, weird, because that's what I'm drawn to. I love green. So this one had a green background, but I decided, you know what? Let's see if people like it better with blue. And it actually looks really good. When I when I photoshopped it with blue, I, li I even like that one better. But I thought that was kind of interesting. For those of you who are selling, look into that. Maybe test that a bit. If you do a lot of green work and it doesn't sell, try changing to blue and see if that makes a difference. Also, let me tighten my chair thing. So yeah, I just thought that was really interesting that galleries weren't bringing in, like a lot of them didn't, they said they couldn't sell it. They couldn't move anything that was, was primarily green. So interesting. Uh, I mean, it's not totally, if I was doing a design and green just worked, I'm not going to not do it, but if blue might look just as good, maybe if you're trying to get that sale, might be something interesting. So, and again, I'm using for me, very anecdotal, anecdotal saying two paintings didn't sell as well that happened to be green, but I thought that was kind of, it reminded me of that. And so that's why I actually on this one changed to blue versus the green original reference. Okay. I've got my water over here. I've got two different distilled waters, one for rinsing the brush and one for loading the brush. Now for acrylic painting, we don't worry about that. Your paint can be, or you're rinsing your water brush, brush water, I can't talk, could be mud and it'll still be fine for acrylics. For, for watercolor, totally different. You wanna load your brush with clean water. And I'm also using distilled water, which I don't use with acrylics. It's, it doesn't really hurt anything, but there's so many chemicals and such in our normal tap water. You, you don't know what's going to cause something to yellow or behave weirdly, so it's just, just use distilled water, keep it safe. You obviously, you can see these are pretty tiny. You don't need a ton of water. So those big, I just get the big gallons like a Target distilled water, I keep one by my easel, super easy. And two little of these bell mason jars. Now we're going to start with blue. I may mix in a little bit of a brown to kind of muddy it up on some of the areas. And I'm probably not gonna go quite as dark as my reference photo is. Now this reference photo, if you'd like to paint along with me over at my website, link is in the video description to that specific photo. So I've already got several colors of teal and blues. So let's see, oh, that's really green. I don't want that much green. Like This one and maybe Let's see how many colors, colors over that. One, two, three, four, five, four. One, two, three, four. So this is actually the one I think I'm gonna use mostly that is really blue. Just gonna load some of that on my brush. Now, actually, I take that back. Let's remember what in the world I'm doing. I'm gonna get this wet anywhere where I'm gonna paint this first. So I'm gonna go around this quickly. This is gonna give me really smooth blending. This is so much better if you can do it while you're working, while your, your paper is flat, because see how mine's dripping? I don't work flat because of my back, but on something like this being smaller, I probably, if I was set up for it tonight, I would, but I'm not. Um, but if you can work flat, you're not gonna have the issue I am of paint running or water running. So I wanna go quickly, because I want this to stay wet. I'm gonna just bring this water over to my easel. By getting it wet and not the subject, it's gonna help the paint to stay where I want it on the background versus going all over the flowers. Now, if it goes all over the flowers, no big deal. I'm going over that with watercolor or with color pencil later anyway. So even if I get color where I really don't want it, it's so easy to fix when you're using colored pencil on top. The color pencil is opaque enough to really cover things well. So. I really like that when working with watercolor. If you are newer to watercolor, you have a harder time controlling it, plan on planning on doing it with colored pencil on top. Colored pencil is so much more forgiving. It really is, um, 
it makes it less scary, much less daunting when you do that, when you know you can fix anything with your colored pencils later. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and start filling that in. Oh, that is a really pretty bright blue, I love it. Now my mat is going to cover, it's gonna actually chop off part here, so I don't need, I'm not super worried about the edges, but I want to make sure that my painting is bigger than what my mat is going to be so none of the white paper shows where I don't want it to. Now I drew my subject out with a 2H graphite pencil. Now, it's not the water-soluble one, and the, the thing that you have to keep in mind, if you use one that is not water-soluble, it the lines aren't going to erase. So if you want your lines to work out so you don't have pencil lines at the end, then you may want to consider using a water-soluble graphite, but the downside there, if you use it that's too dark, it could muddy up because it mixes in with your watercolor. There's pros and cons to everything. The con there is that it may, that gray of the pencil may bleed in with your watercolors. So it just depends on what you're doing as to whether or not that's going to be a good idea for you. But anywhere along my edges, if they're not perfectly smooth, no big deal. I will fix it with colored pencil. Let me know. I've been thinking about doing a colored or a watercolor versus ink tents video. So let me know if that's something you guys are interested in doing the same subject with both mediums and talking about the difference between the two, what, how I tackle the two different mediums differently. Another fun video might be ink tense blocks versus ink tense pencils. Got all kinds of ideas. Now, I did not pre stretch this paper. The arches, all of these watercolor papers will say that they're pre stretched. Not really. Not, I mean, sort of. Um, not in any way that matters. So, you can stretch them, and I did buy the auto stretchers, but I did not stretch this one because it's so small. I usually don't have a big problem with warping paper on something this size. I mean, it, it will warp to an extent, but not quite like I have experienced with... Um, bigger pieces. The bigger it is, it seems like the more likely I am to have major warping. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and dry that. Okay, now I'm gonna do one more layer on top of this. I'm gonna let that cool for a second here. I'm gonna do, so my plan is two layers for the background. And Clark Finer said, did you hear that Derwent is supposed to be coming out with some extra large ink text blocks? You know, I have not talked to Derwent in a very long time. I think they forgot about me. Um, but I also don't know what I would want an extra large block for. Like, I can't think of a case where that would be super useful. White, I take it back, I would use that for white. Maybe black, but I go through white pretty fast with them. Okay, so this is probably, this feels, so trick with watercolor, feel it after it dries. If it feels kind of cool to the touch, 
it's probably still wet. So if the areas may lift up and muddy a bit. I don't care if they muddy though because of how I'm working, how I'm going to be layering this, it makes no difference to me. So I'm not worried about that. But if it feels cool to the touch, it's not all the way dry yet. And so that previous layer is more likely to like really reactivate. Okay, and I'm gonna put, whoops. I'm just gonna get that wet first. I keep doing the same thing. Let's add some water. And I'm just gonna quickly throw that in there. Yeah, I can definitely see where it's not dry. It wasn't dry all the way because it's like way lifting more than um, it would if it was all the way dry. And you can't tell, like by looking at it, it looks dry. Touch it and you'll, you'll be able to feel that it's a bit cool still. That's how you know. Okay. So I'm gonna put more of that same blue so I get a lot of that color saturation. And then areas where I want it to be lighter, I'm not gonna put as much paint. Just let that water work with it. Seriously, painting flat with watercolor is so much easier. Like what I have happening where it kind of starts to run, those are issues that you can avoid pretty well by painting flat, like flat on a table. My neck and back give me the finger when I try to do that, so yeah. If it was a big project that like I was like, putting tons and tons of work into, then I would probably, at least for the base layers, paint flat. My back and neck would have to deal with it. It was one of the reasons for so many years though that I was hesitant to even bother with watercolor knowing that it works better flat. Um, detail you can be up at the easel, no problem, but when you're trying to get these bigger backgrounds in, that can be an issue. But then I realized, you know what, I'm just gonna do it my way. It doesn't have to be exactly like other watercolors. I don't have to have the perfect technique to make something pretty. And I think we often do that when we're coming up, when we're painting. We choose not to do something thinking we have some something holding us back and it's like, you know what, do it your way then. Whatever that thing is that makes you think you can't do something, then change it, do it differently. I've heard people who were colorblind feel that they couldn't paint or draw. Yours may not look like mine, but that doesn't mean that what you come up with isn't going to be stunning. Different isn't a bad thing. Okay, I'm gonna pull a bit of brown. Now brown and blue, when you mix them together, you get more of a black color. And that's kind of what I want here, just this foggy, dark, mixture in there. I've got too much water. See here how it's lifting? That is because my first layer was not really dry. It was sort of dry, but not completely. And I'm really wishing I was painting this flat right now, just to make my life easier. Want me to complain about that some more? I'm on a roll. Okay, and I'm just gonna let that now, I'm gonna soften this up together. So it just fades, we'll see how that looks dry. Another thing that you can do, I don't have it in here. I use my, my spray, my fine mist sprayer all the time with watercolor too. I wanna smooth this out in here. My brush strokes were giving me a really weird texture that I wasn't wanting. So just wet that again. Cleaning up those edges. Cause they're a mess.
And see how messy this is? I don't even care because I know I can fix everything with water, with colored pencil. That is such a big deal to me. Like it just makes it so much more enjoyable because I can be so sloppy and still make it look really good. Okay, let's dry that. You know, see how I've got this harsh line there? I don't like that. I'm just going to reactivate that with my paintbrush and some water. I'm going to soften that out. I don't care if it's a little blotchy. I just don't like that it was a straight line. That's my issue. Now I have to be careful because I'm actually lifting some of this off. But I, want, I just want a softer transition there. Now another thing we can do to give it a pretty cool um, texture, let me grab do I have, yeah, a paper towel. Uh, there's my fine mist sprayer. I'm gonna get this wet and I'm gonna let a little bit of this lift. that set a second and I'm going to pull some of this up and this is going to give me some areas that are a little bit lighter. Just to get that pretty soft feel for that background. And the other thing I'm going to do is take my brush and soften some of this. These harsher edges are really over the petals. So I'm just gonna let that pull into my flower petal now, because they need to be tinted with blue anyway, but I wanna soften those edges so I'm not fighting that harsh line. We'll just pull that a little bit where it was like really, really dark. Soften those out. And this all gets cut off by the mat. Okay, I'm going to dry that again, and then we can start on the flower base layers and the ladybug. Actually, no, I'm missing a whole spot there. Okay, now something that may happen, when you're painting, you're gonna have stuff happen that you're just like, wow, that did not go as planned. Work it into the design, don't throw it away, don't start over. Let's say I had a big blotch somewhere I didn't want. What if I throw bubbles in the background? That would be cool. That's something I throw in a lot of my stuff. I love the look of bubbles. You know, you've got a lot of options. Don't jump to if something didn't go wrong that it's ruined and then toss it. Fill in these little spaces now. Another one right up here. Now 
I see artists regularly get frustrated and want to throw things away. If your drawing is accurate, now let's say you're doing a portrait and you just drew it completely wrong, eyes are not, like that has to be accurate. But if, you're, if your line drawing and everything was accurate, something, let's say a flower petal, you painted over one on accident, great. Flower petals fall off all the time. Leave it that way. Don't give up or start over every time some little thing goes wrong. Instead, figure out how to embrace that and work it into the piece. Get a little bit of brown there, darken that up. Okay. And we'll dry this. Remember, if you have questions, leave them now. I will be answering those and going over that at the end of the project. So now let's go ahead and start. I'm going to start with the stem to make it a little bit easier for me to judge the values. Let's get some of these darks in here um, because I have a feeling I'm going to go way too light on those flower petals and they really are fairly dark. So greens. I don't know if you remember the last time I did one of these colored pencil watercolor combinations. I had commented that the, one of the brushes smelled bad. It wasn't the brush, it was the paint color. One of those brown tones smells terrible when wet. Found that out recently. Okay, um, let's start with this lighter green. It's very easy to make something darker, a lot harder to lighten it up, especially with watercolor. Now, again, I can fix a lot of this with colored pencil, but start light and add the darks as needed versus doing the other way around. Remember, when you want a light color to be lighter, don't jump to, if you're coming from another medium, you may think, we'll just add white. White will make it pastel, but it also isn't going to give you that translucent look of watercolors. Try to let the white of your paper show to get the lighter color. Just build that in more solid. And I've got more of a yellowy tone. I'm going to pull some yellow ochre. I'm just letting that blend right in with the green that's there. Now I have filled in green where my flower is going to go, my petal. Let's wipe some of that off. Well, yeah, it will get covered later. Let's make it easier on myself and not have a harsh line to try to fight. Much better. See, it's a very forgiving medium. I think in some ways watercolor gets a bad rap for being so difficult. Hold on. It's actually fairly forgiving the way you can lift stuff that goes wrong. The tape, like the tape apparently. Oh, the tape is lifting all over. Push that back down. Didn't realize that was coming up. Okay. Now, let's see. We've got some more of the yellow. This is more, this yellow has more of an orangey tint to it. So, I'm still using that yellow oxide or yellow ochre. I'm going to mix some orange in with it though. And it just peeks in in a few areas between the petals, a little bit over the greens. Okay, and I missed a spot of green. We should come up here more.
I'm gonna dry that so it doesn't smudge into my white as much. Now, why did I dry it? Because it can reactivate when I put the white in, yes, but it's not going to reactivate as much if it's drier. The more dry it is, the more it stays put, but if it's dry to the touch, but not really dry, like if you feel it and it's still cool, that's gonna be more likely to smudge into your next color when you're blending the area next to it. If it smudges, it's actually not a big deal, especially white, it's reflective. I don't care if it gets smudged, I will probably pull orange into mine anyway. But that's why that happens or one of the things that you can do to avoid making a horrible mess. Make sure that previous area is more dry. Mine's mm, questionable. Mine may be smudging here. Like I said, I don't really care though. Okay. So now we're getting into some of these petals. So a lot of this, I'm gonna leave the white. Some of these need to be even more white than what I, like I've already pulled more blue, no big deal. You can go over that with the white colored pencil. So, but I'm gonna use the same blue that I used in the background. Actually, hold on, my color, I just made a muddy mess. So this color, I don't know if you can, let's see, where's the palette? This color smudged into my blue and it made it a bit muddy. So I'm gonna just wipe that area off. Just take a wet paper towel, make a clean area so I don't make a muddy, muddy mess. I mean, mud's okay to an extent, but in that case, it wasn't really what I was going for. So I'm just gonna wipe this. I also have a really cool little palette, little porcelain palette here. These are wonderful, but I don't need that color right now and I don't feel like wiping it out. I should probably get some more of those. They're really nice to work on. Okay, so. Back to, let's load a little bit of blue. Now it's clean, there's nothing next to it for me to smudge into, so I'm getting a much cleaner look. Remember with watercolor, the more water that you add, the more translucent that color is going to be like. That's a little on the too light side. I'm gonna have to come back and darken some of that up. We'll just get a base on some of this. Eh, let's add some more. This petal, whoops, more water. Too much. Abort mission. And now not enough. Got Goldilocks and the three bears going on over here. Too much, not enough. I'm gonna let those colors bleed from that light to the dark smudge those together so I get this really pretty transition. Now if you do one petal at a time, you can do um, where you get it just that petal wet and it makes it really easy to blend one at a time instead of jumping around too much. Again, I'll be going over a lot of this with the white, this over here. See, this guy's gonna be much darker. Now, if you're not using colored pencil, you're gonna be a bit more careful and precise about what you're doing. It's because I know I'm going over the, this with colored pencil, I can kind of rush through because you're not gonna see a lot of this. And some of these petals are not even in the right place. I don't care. Like, add an extra petal. It does not matter. Like, that's not something to fuss over. There are several things when I'm painting that I'm going to stress over. That's just not one of them. When it comes to flowers, close is close enough. A lot of the detailing I'm gonna do is just gonna be with white on top. Let's see, let's lighten this up. I'm getting a little too crazy here. And when I say white on top, again, I mean colored pencil. Now I could go over it. I do have the opaque white paints, which is essentially gouache. Um, I can go over it with if I did want to just stick with watercolor. Rinse that off and then let that bleed out. The 
this is actually two petals, which I will separate later. Right now, it can just be one. So there's one, and then there's one down here. And if you're looking at this thinking, I thought it was a white flower. Yeah, this is our base. We want to get all that nice blue in there. And if you look at the reference photo, you'll see where there's a lot more of the orange. I'm going to pull some of that in. A lot of that warmer color is there because the background, the original photograph was a green background. So obviously that's going to be picking up different colors. With mine, white, it's reflective. It's going to pick up what the color is because I changed it to blue. That's why I'm pulling extra blue in mine. A lot of extra blue. Dry that. Tess asked what brand and, um, wow, that is super sketchy. Hopefully it's not doing that on the recording. Um, what brand of watercolor brushes am I using? Right now, this one is a silver black velvet round, the number eight. The one that I used earlier was a Mimic Creative Mark half inch filbert. Okay, now let's get around the ladybug. Yeah, that's the joy of live streaming. They will get really sketchy sometimes. And there's nothing I can do about it. And I don't know why. Um, why sometimes they just kind of give us the finger. Had some detailing here. I'm gonna do with the the paint. I'm using some brown again. Oh, that paint. Let me dry that. Too wet. Okay, these guys have this really neat outline. It's a really dark outline. So just lining through here. Again, I'm not making them exact to the photo. I'm just looking at one area and what's close, what's similar. So I just kind of pick one of those shapes and then paint it in. Is it exact? Heck no. It doesn't need to be. Like I said, if you're doing a portrait, a pet portrait, an animal, there are things that need to be exact. So you want to spend your time on those, not, not worrying so much over like, oh, I missed one of these little lines. That's not going to make a big difference in the end. You want to start separating or figuring out what in your work, it, where, where is close, close enough versus where does it need to be exact? Questions you want to ask yourself. Because I don't want you to feel like you should just get sloppy with everything you do. It just depends on what you're working on. Okay, 
Let's now paint the base layer of the ladybug. The part I think most of us have been looking forward to the most. Um, which red do I want? More of an orangey red. Probably this one. Maybe with a little bit of orange. So actually I'm gonna start with orange. I'm gonna start with that. And then we'll add a little bit uh, more with the red. I'm not gonna worry about the black spots yet. I'm just gonna worry about shading the ladybug. Now here, where I want it to be lighter, I'm going to rinse my brush and use more water. That, let that be thinner. More opaque as we get out to the outer edges, but I want that to be light and look shiny, so let the white of your paper show through. Now I can reload the brush with thicker paint for these outer edges. And then I'm gonna come on top with some different reds as well. Some darker red. This one is that more orange tone. Now, I'm actually getting a little bit of a muddy color because look at my water. Can you see how muddy that is? I need to dump this. Let me dry this um, so it doesn't dry all warped and weird. So what was happening is I was not paying attention and the brush to rinse a couple too many times, I went in the wrong container. Let me dump this and refill it real quick. And you guys can come with me. I gotta love that about the wireless mic. The audio's not as good, but you get to go with me. Now, whenever I use regular tap water to rinse out these jars, I also dry them after to get the tap water back out before I refill it with um, the distilled water. I mean, if you let it dry, you're fine, but I wanna make sure all of those nasty chemicals in our tap water are out of this before I refill it. Maybe I'm being a bit neurotic or too paranoid, entirely possible, but if I'm going through the effort of using distilled water, why risk mixing the two? Probably also my reef keeping um, experience is getting involved in this. Like I don't use tap water for anything with the reef. So that may be part of why I'm being a little bit too neurotic. <coughs> okay. Rinse that brush. Re well, not rinse it, making sure that's clean. Okay. Now I'm going to pull some of this red. This is more of a red, red. See, this time I rinsed it, I was smart. I used it in the dirty water for rinsing. Look at me doing my job right. It's a Christmas miracle. I'm gonna come down to a deeper burgundy type color. I'm gonna pull this in right here. That is not wet enough. Actually, you know what? This color looks like that would be good mixing with it really dark. And we're gonna darken up this edge even more. And then we've got this little batch that kinda comes in. And then darker again here. And I'm gonna rinse that. And I'm going to dry it. Yeah, it looks a little dull, no problem, because I, I have a little too white there. I'm actually gonna lift some more. Let's lift a little bit of this. And then I'm gonna go right over that. Let me dry it again. And back to the red, maybe a little bit of orange. little bit 
bit more water in that. There we go. get his little head. So his little head, I'm going to start with dark blue. I am not going to jump into, I could do blue. Let's throw a little bit of red in there too. I am not going to jump straight into black because if I do, I can't really go darker than that. So you can see I'm mixing these colors here. I want it dark. I just don't need it that dark. Get a little nubbin sticks out. white here so let's at least leave that in one of the things that I like so much with watercolor is the tiny tiny little detail you can get with it so enjoyable legs and I apparently did not fill in enough with the background so let's actually I take it back I was going to fill in the background see this spot I missed here and here I was going to do that with watercolor I'm not going to get it smooth if I do instead I'm going to do that with colored pencil we'll leave it alone pretty sure I can color match that okay let's get our little black dots so we've got a bigger one over here now same thing actually that one I'm going to start with blue this one's got a highlight on him. You know, part of that highlight I will really pick up with a colored pencil, but. Okay, now I can come on top with my black where I want the darker areas of his little head. You know, I'm not sure. Um, Art of Raven D said I can't tell if it's a tiny flower or a really big ladybug. I don't know. That's just, I think it's a tiny flower. That's how it was on the reference photo. I actually did go by the reference photo on that. So we've got a shadow here. We've got another dark area here and then another one comes around here and then he's got like a little on the thicker thigh there same thing he needs a thicker thigh and then here, what else do we have? Little antenna guys sticking out over here. Okay. And we are ready for colored pencil. So that's all I'm gonna do for the underpainting with watercolor. And it just saves so much time. And it's not that I don't enjoy doing straight colored pencil. Um, somebody left a comment recently on a video saying they didn't feel that people should put, try to do a blurry painterly look with colored pencil. Why? It can do it just fine. It takes longer, but it's also really enjoyable. So use whatever method you want, but this is a nice way to really save some time on getting your base layers in. That would take me a very long time with colored pencil to get that level of color saturation. So let's go ahead and while I put this away, we'll have our standard message from the boys. I really need to make a new ad, but you know, it's what we've got. Without treats, these puppies are so sad. Your Patreon pledge of only $4 or more gives them cookies of happiness. Act now and the bad cow gets a treat too. Oh, and you also get over 300 art lessons and a new one every single week, plus other rewards. Sign up at patreon.com slash lockery. Good job on the work for your ad boys. Every, everyone is impressed. Look at how hard you work. 
Okay, now I need my colored pencils up here. Oof. You know, this is probably making things harder on myself. I'll just pull out the individual colors. What do I need? Uh, my white, which is not even over there. Actually, it looks like most of the colors I need are, are not even there. Yeah. I'm just going to grab a handful. These are the colors I'm using right now on the oranges. Yeah, lots of colors. That's a lot of pencils just for some oranges. That also goes to show when I often talk about it's about your values, not so much the color. This is all me getting various values with for oranges. You wouldn't think there'd be that many. Okay, move this out of the way. Do a little rearranging. What am I going to need? So I had the white. I do need some, actually, I take it back. I think the greens I have, I think everything I have out will work for this. Now, if needed, you absolutely can, <coughs> can use odorless mineral spirits on your colored pencil over your watercolor. The, wa the OMS will not affect or lift the watercolor. Hardly anything will budge. So those are very compatible. Now, you do want to make sure anything you're going to do with watercolor, that needs to be done before you start with colored pencil. Once I start putting colored pencil on here, watercolor is not going to stick anymore. You're putting a water-based product then on top of an oil or wax base. That won't work. You want to do the reverse. That's why we did our water-based product first. Now we can put the oil and wax-based pencils on top of that. So what would happen, and it's something you could actually do as a kind of neat technique. Let's say I had something I wanted to stay super white. I could have taken my white watercolor pencil, or not watercolor, um, colored pencil, and put that on. It is going to keep that paper pretty white. It like seals it almost. It kind of protects it. So it actually... Do I have anything? I can show you. Let me do a quick little sample of what would happen. Um, let me grab some watercolor again real quick, even though I just put those away. Do I have white or water? Here we go. It will stain it some, but not to the same extent because it doesn't really stick. See how you can still see where I wrote? So that is something that you can do to protect the white um, of certain areas. But it's, it does stain it. But see how it doesn't really stick the same. It doesn't soak in the same as what you would get with just the white of the paper. So that is what would happen. But the other thing is those areas aren't really archival. So let's say, well, great, now it's a light blue. It's not really permanently gonna stick there that well. So it's not going, um, it's something you normally want to avoid. But in this case, let's say I was trying to keep one of those white petals super light and it will not, like watch what happens when it dries. It'll depend a little bit on which pencil you use. But what are you doing up? Go lay down. No one invited you. You don't get just to tell me what you want. Good try, bad cow. It's just on there. It's stained. Whether or not that's going to be permanent, hit or miss. So anyway, kind of a little trick there. But that's why we're not going on top of this too um, with colored pencil when we're done. I do need to find a good blue to color match that background so I can clean up my edges where I was super sloppy. This might work. Ooh, that's a good blue. Okay. So I'm just going to first start out by cleaning up that edge where I didn't fill in enough. I'm going to keep this blue pencil out because that looks good. And I've got some glassine if I need to rest my hand while I draw. So we'll start with that section. The reason that I use glassine is one, nothing's going to stick to it. So let's say I, what is this doing? There we go. Let's say I got accidentally a little bit of colored pencil under this. It's not going to stick to it and like smudge as I move this around, whereas a regular piece of paper will or can. 
ask me how I know. Um, it's not a pleasant experience. The, but something like tracing paper, any paper is better than nothing. You don't want to rest your hand on the paper because people juices, the oils from your skin, not archival. So we want to keep that off the work as much as possible. Okay. And white. I'm just going to start with one of the petals. Now the two pencils, my go-to pencils for this will be the Derwent Lightfast white and the Derwent Drawing Chinese white. They're my, more my two more opaque pencils if I've got my Lightfast. There's like a million pencils by, the, by Derwent that look almost white. This one and Arctic are pretty close. And pencil sharpener. I'm not quite ready to switch mediums. There we go. Just gonna go in over that. Oh, look how pretty and soft that edge is now. I do want to flatten this out though. This is kind of a hot mess up here. And I'm just gonna blend, clean that up, and I will blend that right into my background. I am going to use a little bit of OMS right there, though, to smooth that out. And where did my blending brush? There it is. And you'll see what I mean. This really doesn't affect. See how I'm wiping it right over the watercolor? Look how it doesn't lift it. It doesn't do anything. This is just odorless mineral, mineral spirits to smooth it little darker but it'll dry light again and I might go over that with a lighter polychromos we'll see um, when that dries but it doesn't see what I mean by it doesn't move it doesn't affect if I had done that with water it would just it would have lifted a lot by scrubbing the way I did didn't do anything so or like it didn't do anything negative I mean it blended the pencil without making a mess See, this guy's more outlined. So he's pretty dark, a lot darker than what I've got. So I'm going to take that same pencil since the color is so similar. Let's darken up this petal. And this guy, I need to leave this alone because this paper is wet. I need to let that dry all the way before I go back over. I've got to do a little bit of touch up there on correcting the, where these petals go. This guy comes this way, and then this is a very light white one. So I'm pushing pretty hard, really burnishing that to get that bright. And look how bright that gets. Let's see, Ghostwriter said, uh, Pebbles and Bailey to Bad Cow and Darling Dwayne. It's actually Gibson is the other one. Thank you so much. Also, holy crap, look at them. They know that, whoops, wrong thing. Seriously? You two? You're, you're very bad. What is this? Say, I know that we got a super chat and that means we get a tasty treat. So bad. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Ghost Rider. Rotten boys. Those are, see, this is why you're called a bad cow. Okay, good boy. Take it to your bed. Good boy, Gibson. Oh my gosh, that is too funny. Okay, Wade, you go lay down. Yours is gone. Lay down. Go lay down. Go lay down. You're n no, you're not going to beg. You know we don't allow begging here. Go, boys. And if you are interested in owning this ladybug piece for yourself, it's a 5 by 7 and it will come matted. Let me show you that. Where is the mat? So this one is small enough. It's actually easy for me to ship it mat sit matted. So this one will be matted just like that in a black mat. This starting bid, I believe, is $55. Oh, no, again, <laughs> Pauline said, Vandersloot, Vandersloot said, the babies want a snack. Do you hear that? Okay. You know, this is actually, though, really good training for them. Believe it or not, as many treats as they're getting, and thank you, Pauline, this is good for them because they're the whole, like, listen to me, I'm giving you a, a command, come here, lay down, come here. It's actually really, really good practice. Huh, you'll like this kind of practice. See, thank you, Pauline. Good boys. Okay, go lay down, lay down. Command given, lay down. 
You're like, uh-oh, mom's snapping fingers. She's serious. Okay. Jason said, they're not bad. They're smart. Yeah, they, they actually are very well. Let's be realistic. Gibson's a genius. Wade is extremely food driven, but not the brightest cow, huh? <laughs> look, at, look at that cow face. Oh, his face isn't even on camera. Hold on. Let me fix that. Can't even see your cow face. Yeah, kind of. Okay. Oh my God, <laughs> Patessa said it one more time. Okay, boys, you want another cookie? It's a super chat from Tessa. Yeah, is this good practice? You like this game? Is this the funnest game ever? It's the best night ever. Back up. Ready? Okay. You're being a good cow, not taking it from me too hard. Much better. Yeah, how huh, much better, not biting mom's hand. Okay, boys, go lay down, down, down. I know, they're like, why? You just keep giving us more. Go lay down, down, Wade, down. Bad cow, lay down. He's trying to turn back around. He's like, but are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Oh my gosh. Okay, thank you guys so much. Um, and you just paid for another bag of the word I'm not gonna say. Okay. Let's come down here. Well, that one, that one's actually probably dry enough. I can probably, yep. And then this one, we're gonna get a little bit more detailing in here. It's really bright right along that edge. And then we need that pencil. This is the Polychromos Middle Phthalo Blue. Let me sharpen that. It's funny, before I even start the live stream, like just the days that I'm getting stuff ready, they'll come in here and wait. They're like, this is fun time for us. We like super chat days. We've got a little bit more detail, a little streaky here. More of a shadow right under the ladybug. Now see where I just took the pencil and I went right over his leg? Well, now his leg doesn't stand out. No worries, I'm just gonna go over that with black later. Black or... Um, uh, deep by, um, nightshade would also work. So we come over here. I'm going to clean this up by pushing a little bit harder along this petal because this one's darker. It's going to make that look even whiter. Cleaning up that edge. Looks like I added an extra petal in here at some point, so whatever. Bonus petal. It's one of the reasons I often start people, like if somebody comes to me and they want to start learning portraits, I generally will start them with roses, even though portraits is their goal. Because if you miss a petal, it's not discouraging, it's no big deal, it's still pretty, and you're still getting the hang of like how to blend whatever medium you're working in, your values, all of that, getting something to look curved and rounded and three-dimensional. If I miss a nose on a person, obviously it's a bigger issue than a petal on a flower. And usually I'll do a couple of roses and then go ahead and start them on portraits, but just to get, let them get the hang of whatever medium that they're going for. It's not that I want to keep them on roses for the next two years or anything like that. We're gonna jump into the portraits pretty soon, just not the first thing. That went out a little longer. Now this is coming out a little bit grainy and gritty. I'll just go right over that with my um, OMS. Smooth it right out. And like here, this corner, have more of the background, so we'll just pull into that. And now you can really see what I'm talking about with it. It's so easy to clean stuff up when we start with a colored pencil. 
That's why I'm not going to spend too much time perfecting everything with the watercolor. Pushing really hard there where I want that to be nice and white. Maybe a little bit more light on the edge there. This one had two petals, that one and the one behind it. Getting more details in there. This one actually curved in a bit, so we can correct that. And a few more shadows with the lines. I don't have to push terribly hard with a blue one. And it's a little bit lighter on some of these than what you guys are seeing. Let me see if I can correct this a little bit. Now that we've got color on here, it's still, it's like the whites are not looking quite white enough. Come on, drag. Oop, not that much. Too much. Yeah, that I still can't get that exposure quite right. It's close. The blue is a little bit too much like the background, I think. Let me see if this looks a little bit more accurate over here. Well, it's on a big board, so it's not super convenient to pull over, but yeah, that looks better. You can see that the flower stands out a lot more than what you're seeing. There we go. So that gives you a much better idea. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna pull a little bit of orange, or maybe a peach. That should work. This color is medium flesh. Makes me think of zombies. Just a little bit in here. And if you've got questions, leave those now. I will be coming back to those once the painting is done. I'm gonna switch over to a yellow. Really the, re the colors that I'm choosing are mostly based on what I already had out. Color. Is that one actually called apricot? Yeah, that one's apricot. Get a little shading on these guys. These little details are just so, I love this stage. It's so fun and it sticks so well. So with um, ink tense, I don't love as much the combination of colored pencil with ink tense. It doesn't stick as well. I usually just do ink tense by itself. Um, between the pencils and the blocks, but the colored pencil, oh my gosh, it sticks so well to watercolor. I'm going to blend out a little bit of this, soften some of my white, and it's going to look darker, but it'll dry back opaque again.
So again, it just, I love how it does not move the watercolor at all. Okay, while well that dries, I do, <coughs> I do want to do a little bit more in here, but I'm going to go ahead and come over to this ladybug. And a portrait in ink tense? Yeah, probably not. Um, that's not a medium that, the way I do portraits, it, it doesn't behave, like it would not be my favorite medium. Like in an animal one, yeah, but like a people portrait, that is not, like so much, the, here's the thing with ink tense. It's not all light fast. Some of the colors are, some are not. It's not super easy once they're in the blocks to tell which one's which. And I am not gonna put that level of work that a, a portrait would take into a medium that is not light fast. I love it for things for making prints, but making a print of a person, most people aren't like gonna be interested in. It just doesn't make a lot of sense for me um, to use ink tense for that. Watercolor, maybe but I want to get a bit more practice with watercolor before I try that. Um, portraits are one of the more difficult things. So yeah, I don't know with ink tense. I may change my mind someday, but I don't think so. Um, not for that medium. Um, just kind of like acrylics. I don't do portraits typically with acrylics. I have a surreal one, but it's not my favorite medium to work with with, with um, portraits as well. I like oils better for portraits. Okay, um, ladybug. I need black. Do I even have? I don't think I have black paint or a black pencil out at all. Let me grab one. Yeah, I think some mediums are like perfect for portraits, and some it's like, wow, I'm making my life a lot more difficult using this medium versus another one. Not just that it's more time consuming, that part doesn't bother me. Like, just way more difficult. That medium doesn't do what I want to for blending. Not for the way I do with portraits. So I'm just going to go back over his legs. I'm also going to use a polychromos white. Do I have one out? I do not. And this is why I have a chair with wheels. So I want to get a little bit of a highlight, but I don't want it so opaque like what the um, luminance, or the, either the luminance, the Derwent drawing, or the, the uh, Derwent light fast. They're too opaque for this highlight. I just want to lighten it a bit. So that's why I'm switching over to my polychromos because it's more translucent. I can still really see what's under it. I just want to get that highlight there. Oops, there's a little too hard for how sharp I had that. And then a highlight over his head. Notice that the highlight goes over the black part of that black spot too. So that gives you that more shiny look. And the same thing with his head here. We've got that highlight right in this area with the dark around it. If we didn't, if we would have just done the whole thing solid black, it you lose that shine, you lose the three-dimensional look. Okay, next I want to do a little bit of shading. We're almost done here. Just grab a couple of greens. Darker green now. This one is moss green. And then this will also really work for tinting some of this color. Just so it's not quite so flat. And a lot of this would be a lot darker anyway. Little bit of highlights. I'm gonna use that same polychromos white just to pull a few out. Whoops, dropping my pencils. And 
Let's use a bit of OMS, smooth some of that out. little bit more detail and we'll be just about done. But again, you can bid on this guy over at my website. Link is in the video description if you want to own this guy. I think starting bid is $55. And I'm trying to think what else. Okay, so those are dry. I'm gonna get a little bit more with the polychromos white for some line details in here. I'm burnishing, I'm like pushing hard with this. But I do wanna to tone this one, it's just standing out a little too much. Just a little bit of blue on there. Even though it is that light on the reference photo, it's just drawing too much of my attention to it, more than what I want it to. So this is where, as an artist, you have to come through and go, okay, what will make mine look better? I want it bright, just not that bright. So cute. I love how this guy came out. So one of the things I want to do on the edges, they look a little too perfectly outlined. I'm going to pull a little bit of that blue, let those sketchy details go right in. So it gives you a better transition. edge with something a little bit more opaque here. Now, as always, if this does sell, if tomorrow when I come at it with fresh eyes, I may do a little bit of touch-ups here and there, but that is pretty much done. What I'm doing is looking at the camera, what it shows on camera, because it's kind of the same as stepping away from it. I love how the ladybug, like, Oh, I'm so happy with that. I do want a little bit more shading though, now that I look at it on that. Let me pull a little bit of brown. These ones. I'm just gonna dot, especially closer to the greens. Let's darken this up. There we go. And that is it for this guy. He is all done. Let me pull him over here so you can see better. And I do need to sign him, and I'll show you how he'll sit in the mat. So this gives you a better uh, representation of the color and the details there. Oh, I like him. He's cute. He's a little. I think that'll get blurry. Yeah, I don't think you can really see when I go that close. But that is the finished painting for this guy. Now, whenever you sign your work, if you're going with something that's a standard size like this, you need to account for the mat. So what I will do is grab the mat. Grab, let's see, what pencil will I sign this with? Probably white. Position the mat where, oh, I should show you the actual screen. So I'm gonna position that mat where I want him. There we go. That is how I wanted him positioned. So it really puts the ladybug in that bottom lower third. So if we went by the rule of thirds, that ladybug is hitting that nice spot. And where do I want the signature? Here or here? Here. So now you can see, if I would have signed all the way at the bottom, this is a mistake a lot of people make. They just think, okay, 
sign it at the bottom edge. What's your standard mat size? If you did this to be a standard, which I did to be a five by seven, I just painted in around the edges so that I don't have to worry about like white showing where I didn't want it to show. But if that signature was down here, you're gonna completely cover it with the mat. So by holding that mat there, that gives you a much better idea of where to sign it. And the nice thing in this case, the thing I like about the white or the black mat is it pulls out the ladybug. It makes him stand out more and the flower not as much. Now, if you use a white mat, I can actually show you the difference. It's pretty interesting. It'll bring out a different look completely. So what I usually recommend artists do when they're matting their work, or if you buy artwork, take it with you and try on a few different matte colors because white looks totally different than what black would look like. I feel like here with, and I, one of the things with white mats that I don't like, I feel like you notice the matte too much, but the black, it really keeps your attention within that piece and focused more on the ladybug because the black in the ladybug is pulled out with it. So there you go. That is the finished piece. Again, you can bid on that at my website. I don't think there's any bids, so you really could get this for, for the $55. Let me pull that up. Oh, there is one bid. I lied. Um, so yay, he's definitely going home with somebody. And he will go along with the dandelion from last week. I forgot to put one more coat of varnish, I forgot. Um, on that guy, these guys will get shipped probably this coming weekend. So yay. And before we get started, we'll do one more ad. Hey, you, yes you, I see all your unused art supplies over there. Oh my God, those brushes aren't even opened yet. Tragic. You keep buying new fancy materials, but you don't use them because you don't want to waste them. Stop making your art supply sad. Sign up for art lessons for as little as $4 a month. There are over 300 painting and drawing lessons available when you sign up and new ones every week. Patreon.com slash Lockree. Okay, so on to the first subject I wanna talk about tonight. When do you need to move from using, actually, let me move this out of the way. Hold on, this is distracting. I need to make a couple of adjustments. I wasn't as ready as I thought I was. Um, I've got stuff all over the place that make it harder for me to edit these down later on because there's too much stuff up here. Yeah, that's kind of better. My life just got easier. Okay, when do you need to upgrade to professional quality art supplies? Is it okay to, why are you still playing? Sorry about that. There we go. When do you need to upload, update, what? Words, oh my gosh, how many false starts am I gonna have to this? When do you need to upgrade to quality professional art supplies? How long should you keep using the student grade? It really depends on what your goals are. So I know a lot of us start with these kits and it's got pencils and colored pencil and every medium you could think of in there. Those are great, but I really prefer those more for doodles, for sketchbooks, for color compositions for sketchbooks. I love that sort of thing for that. However, if you are trying to learn a medium, starting with student grade, which really, I don't even think student grade is a proper term. It's just cheap, doesn't work so great quality. Um, great, I guess. We, we see the, these videos where YouTubers who are professional artists or are already really good, they'll be like, look what I can do with Crayola. That's because they're a professional. You're, if you're a beginner, you're not going to get those results with Crayola. You're not gonna to learn to blend your colored pencils well. You're not gonna learn how to mix your colored pencils well because they don't blend well in the first place. They don't layer that great. Can you give me those supplies and I can make something great with it? Yeah, but that's because I'm using years and years and years of experience to be able to manipulate that medium into sort of working. You could give me a cup of coffee and a paintbrush and I'm gonna make something cool with it just because of my understanding of values and, and all of those things. So some of these videos that you see on YouTube, I think they're very very deceiving or misleading in people thinking, no, you can learn with Crayola. No, praying watercolor, they're awesome. I'm gonna get a bunch of thumbs down for that because some people really like praying for some reason. You do you. But what happens is if you're actually taking this seriously, you're trying to go further than just doodling, you really want to learn colored pencils or pastels would be another one that, that, that really makes a difference. Your acrylic paints. 
let's say Reeves. Reeves was one that was bad and Royal Lang Nickel, and I'm not even gonna go into the generic crap, but a lot of those do not layer right, not like Liquitex, and it's funny because I use Liquitex Basics, which is student grade, but they're light fast, they just perform well. Um, anyway, those paints with Liquitex, let's say I'm doing a glazing medium, it works fine, it works great. If I'm teaching somebody to try to use those techniques and they're using a crappy brand, a crappy paint, what happens is they'll put the second layer over even though that first layer was dry and it starts to lift up. It like doesn't adhere to the canvas right. That's something that does not happen with Liquitex Basics. So if somebody's new, they're trying to learn how to use a new medium, that's going to be extremely frustrating and discouraging. The idea of, well, I'm just a beginner so I can use the cheap stuff, Again, Liquitex Basics is fairly cheap, but that that holds a lot of people back and a lot of people give up. A lot of people will get these super cheap colored pencils thinking, well, let's see, I don't even know how I'm gonna like it. I'm just gonna give it a try with this set of 200 pencils that are however many that I might be over exaggerating, but this larger set, I'm gonna get this big old set and see if I like it. You're not gonna know if you like it. That isn't a good example of what that pencil is. So occasionally you'll find some cheap one that kind of works okay, but a lot of them don't lend well. They don't layer well. They just don't perform in a way that gives you a good idea if you would even like them. And it can be very, very discouraging for a new artist who's just like, oh, I'm bad at colored pencil. It won't layer like that person's did. Well, yeah, that pencil can't layer like the pencil I was using. That's largely the problem. So what do you do instead? You'd obviously, you're not gonna wanna invest hundreds and hundreds of dollars into something like that that you're not sure if you're gonna like. Get a set of 12. Get a set of 12 polychromos and add on an opaque, like a Derwent Drawing Chinese White or Derwent, uh, Derwent Light Fast White to that set, that's all you need. That set of 12 is enough for you to mix any color you need. You really don't need every color available. Get quality supplies, just get fewer of them. Get just black and white. Then you're focusing on your values. So not only are you, hel you helping yourself by doing a lot of black and white pieces and really getting a good understanding of values before you jump into the color, you are using quality materials that are gonna blend right. They're gonna layer right. Same thing, acrylics, you can do just oils, just black and white. Don't feel like you need to get every color out there. I understand where somebody isn't gonna wanna invest tons and tons of money if they don't know if they're gonna like it, but you're not gonna find out if you like it if you're using really low quality materials that just won't do what they're supposed to do. And again, I know I said, I, I brought this up already, but you have a lot of videos. Look what I did with, with Crayola. That's because that artist is able to manipulate any medium into working right because they have so much experience. If you don't have that level of experience, don't expect the same results. That it's just going to be frustrating. So I recommend even while you're learning, get the good stuff. Now the exception for me on that would be kids. Usually once once the, the student hits 12, that's when I go into the good stuff. Before that, most of what they're doing is doodling anyway. There's just something about kids that their brains don't really understand art. Like it's weird because with kids, if you start out a four-year-old or a three-year-old out with violin, that's the age you want to start when they're really little. You don't want to wait till they're 20 to start with violin. But art is different. There's something about the way that the brain works that once a student hits about 12 years old, I find that all of a sudden it's like, oh, things make sense to me that just completely, no matter how many times I was shown, did not make sense before. So that would be one exception. With kids, let them, whatever the cheap stuff is, just let them play, let them have fun. I don't take art classes with, with the younger ones as serious. The main thing with a little one is that I just don't want to discourage them, let them have fun. But once a student hits about 12, that's when I say jump into the higher grade stuff. You don't have to get the most expensive, but don't get the cheapest crap you can find on Amazon either. That is not going to make for a fun time for anyone involved. Now, if you're thinking, well, I can't get the good stuff right now. I don't have any money. I understand this economy is a disaster, but let's say you're thinking I can't get the expensive stuff. I give up. I'm not going to draw. No, that is not what I'm saying at all. I want you to create, I don't care what you use to create, get that cup of coffee and a piece of of paper. And like, I don't care how you, what materials you use. I care that you create. But when you're shopping, when you're deciding, okay, it's time for me to get some new materials. Should I get the good stuff or should I get the cheap stuff? Get the good stuff, just less colors. I would rather see you have fewer of better than a whole lot of crap that isn't going to help you grow. Okay, now, um, and again, just don't, don't think, well, that's it, I'm out. No, use what you have whatever you have, just paint, draw, that matters more. Okay, so let's go through and see what, if you guys have left any questions. Um, I have no questions. Um, I will scroll up. Oh, 
Never mind, they just all came through. I do not need to scroll. Here we go. Dora said, hi, what do you think about painting with deco art craft paint? Is that bad practice? Should I only use regular acrylics benefits problems? Interesting question. I actually have a friend. Some of you may remember Corey Simpson. I don't know if he's still doing, I don't, I haven't seen a video from him in a long time, but I made fun of him for that for years using craft paint. It was a start for him and he's amazing and he was able to get really cool results, but the results he got when he switched to Liquitex Basics, night and day. Totally different because they blend better. They work differently. They, they like, it's just such a difference. So it, that's kind of the same thing that, that those little tubes, um, I think that's what they were, the, oh, where did it go? You said the deco art craft. Yeah, aren't those those little like tubes? Um, I use those when I paint crafty things. Like I have these metal ladybugs hanging on my fence and one had faded really bad. So I recently bought a bunch of those 97 cent ones off Amazon and just sat there and it looks great now. But I'm not going to use that on art and I'm not, it's the same thing that I was just talking about. It doesn't really layer right. It doesn't blend the same. It's a very different material medium. I'd rather you use that than nothing. But if given the option, hands down, go into the Liquitex Basics. They perform so differently. Look, I had already answered your question and didn't even know it yet. Heather said, do you have the 20 new ink tents yet? I don't. If so, I can't wait to see the next piece with nightshade in ink tents. Oh, there's nightshade. I need to contact them. I'm going to have to give them a call and because they, they change whoever like the person my contact was and I don't have a person currently and don't mind me. I apparently and I'm tying my shirt because I am classy like that. There we go. All back together. So no, I need to get a hold of someone over there. I don't know who my contact would be. I'll find someone. Pax's mom said, thank you for teaching wa this a watercolor tutorial. Please do more. I really appreciate it. Lovely work. Look forward to more. Yay. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it. Um, let's see. Kathy said, we'd love to see how the oranges are coming along. I can actually show you that. That is, I, let me move this because I don't want to hurt him since he's already sold. Somebody's buying him. Where can I put you to keep you very safe? You can go over here for right now. I always get nervous once something has sold or there's a bid because I really don't want to ruin the thing that has sold. Okay. So I didn't get super far in the oranges because I was sick all weekend, but I did. Whoops. I'm ruining my set here, walking into my lights. Get up there. Stop trying to get away. Um, I did get some done before I decided I could not breathe through my nose and didn't want to work anymore. Uh, the lighting is not amazing, but it gives you a pretty good idea. This branch, oh my gosh, that was so time consuming. Like that was just... That was a, that, that took a lot longer than, than I thought it would. And it's not even finished. I've got to clean a few little things up, up. but, um, I getting going here now on this orange and that is going to take a very long time because it has to be so, so these are slightly out of focus. This is the one thing that's like really, really crisp. So I'm going to be taking a decent amount of time for that. So I'm very excited about this piece and can't wait to get back to work on it. Uh, I think Friday night is when I get to start back with it. Tomorrow we'll be editing all the videos here. Okay. Let's see. And then this, um, for those of you on Patreon, you should have had the lesson up to this this, <coughs> this week. I was going to do the voiceover yesterday. I totally sounded like a frog. I was coughing constantly. I'm like, I can't record this. This is not even possible. So, and it's like seven hours of footage just for these oranges so far. It is, it's more than seven hours. Yeah, it's a big project. So it's going to be late. I apologize. I blame it on being sick, but I'm not sick now. So now I need to get my butt back to work. Um, let's see. See, so Jenneth said, do you have many art supplies of many media? And if you lose interest, what do you do with the supplies? I have never really completely lost interest in anything. It's art and I like to create things. So, I mean, I may go a long period, like I haven't done ink tents in a really long time, which means I really want to do ink tents. Like I'm like really, really excited to do another ink tents piece. Although apparently I need to get that nightshade color. So, um, I don't just give up on supplies. The only thing that kind of came close to me on that is the ink tents, uh, the Winsor Newton pigment, not ink tents, Winsor Newton pigment markers because they stopped making them. And that's very discouraging when I'm like, well, then why bother? I can't get more of these. Although people are saying their watercolor one is the same. I need to contact the company and, and get some answers on that my, directly um, firsthand because I'm only hearing things secondhand. But um, 
And that's the only me, and I still have them. I, I don't throw things away. I'm borderline hoarder. I'm a very weird balance of, I, sh I would be on the hoarder show if it weren't for I was also super neurotic and want my house to look like a model home all the time and be super clean. My studio is kind of the exception to that. Like, it's not, it's messier than the rest of my house. But um, it's a very weird contrast there between hoarder, really neurotic and wanting everything super clean. But there we go. Um, so I don't throw them away. I wouldn't throw anything away. Like I just, I couldn't bring myself to. Um, Brittany said, can you paint with watercolor paints, watercolor pencils, wet over Derwin's Inktense pencils? Have anything show, and have anything show up? I never have. I don't know why you would. Like I can't think of a case where I would feel the need to do that. You should, I mean, it should be compatible. You should be able to. I'm just not sure why you would. Uh, Sue Jenna said, which is your most favorite top medium? Uh, top medium? I'm not sure what that question is. I'm sorry. Sorry, I think there's something being lost in translation. Like, my favorite medium in general, like, if I could only work in one thing ever again, it would probably be acrylic paints because I can pretty much do anything with that in the airbrush. Um, colored pencil would probably be right behind that, but I really like oils. So I'd go acrylics, colored pencil, oils, Maybe graphite or charcoal and ink tents is kind of all in that same place. I don't know. Guys, yeah, knows that are all artist hoarders? I think so. Um, but are all of us so neurotic that everything has to be clean either? I, that, that's the question. How many of you guys, let me know, how many of you are as like neurotic about cleanliness everywhere as I am? It's, it's a ridiculous thing. Um, let's see. And being organized and like, I don't want stuff on my counter. There's very, very little on my counter. Plants, uh, a betta fish. Um, it's not like a, oh, you, I can't put a fish there because germs. I'm not worried about that. Like it's clean, but I, I don't want, like somebody had mentioned, one of my friends was telling me I needed some kind of a blender thing. And I'm like, uh, maybe if it'll go under the counter, but I don't want it sitting on the counter. And she's like, why? Because obviously I have, I have such a, my kitchen's big, like a lot of counter space. And I'm like, because it doesn't look how I want it to, neurotic. I'm not a normal person. I know that. Okay. Um, let's see. Do I put a fixative on watercolor? I do not. It doesn't need it. It's in the paper. It's not coming off. I do put it behind glass though. I frame everything behind glass. So, um, Mona Lisa said, hi, Lisa. Sorry. I'm just joining. What a beautiful painting. Thank you. I love ladybugs. By the way, your studio, it looks so cozy and comfortable. Thank you. That's what I was going for. And I find, and this is a good tip for everybody. I find that it's easier to sit down and more enjoyable. The whole process of art is so much more enjoyable if you set up your environment in a way that just makes you comfortable and happy. Some people that's a super bright lit room, every white walls, everything's white. I am not comfortable in that environment. I need more like what you're seeing around me. I've got all over where the boys are I've got plants that lighting's not great it's actually really pretty over there it's overexposed on that camera but I've got plants with the lights what you're seeing back there is how it is like with the lights I mean they're not red and blue normally they're just white but with the, the little fairy lights all of that that is how I have this room all the time I've got a ladder hanging with plants from the ceiling like the whole if you just want to make your space wherever you're painting or drawing very comfortable. For many, many years, my bedroom was my art studio. That's fine too. It's not like you have to have a dedicated art studio. It's just that the space that you're going to spend time painting and drawing, trying to make that very comfortable and cozy to you will make the whole like, it, it just helps me anyway to get more in the mood to paint and draw because it's like, this is my, my space I like to be in with my tea or whatever. Like you just create this cool environment for yourself. I don't like painting, like, I know some people will go paint in the garage so it doesn't make a mess. I don't like that environment. I am not comfortable out there. It is not going to make, like, it's not happening for me. Um, let's see. Uh, would it be ergonomically good to do this painting on a tabletop easel upright? I mean, good for neck and good for viewing your painting as you do. Well, I work, as far as being ergonomical, I have arthritis in my back of my neck, so I can't like look down for very long. Um, I work upright all the time. I'm always at an easel. So what you saw is just tape to a board and add an easel. So yeah, it is better for your back and your neck if you're working upright, but with watercolor, just the way that watercolor works, it, it's better to be flat or as flat as possible because it's less likely to run and there's some really cool effects that you can get when you're working flat where you've wet the paper and you let the watercolor paint just kind of spread in that area that you put it. 
I can't do that working upright. I am very limited in the effects that I'm going to get, but because I use it as an underpainting, it doesn't really matter. Um, so yeah, more better for your back and your neck. Yes, better for the artwork, not with watercolor. Okay. Whoops. Looks like we've got another bid on the auction. Um, where did that? I lost Discord. There it is. Angela said, I love the live streams. I, <coughs> sorry. I haven't missed one in weeks. Yay. How do you come up with ideas that you can use in these lessons? So part is just from a lot of experience and I can usually look at a reference photo and know that, okay, that'll take me about an hour and a half because I don't want to spend more. I, well, I try to go with an hour because we always have, you know, I forgot to do something or a late start because the mic isn't working, whatever. So about an hour is what I go for when I look at a project. But that does limit me because I have to do something that, can I make this look good in an hour? Um, I go through through Unsplash and Pixabay normally and look for stuff there. The the Ladybug and Daisy, that was a suggestion somebody had requested in, in watercolor and colored pencils. That specific combo was or requested last week. So that's why, was it Dolphin Soul? Who requested that? Um, that's why I chose this one but normally yeah I just go through unsplash and I just scroll down until I find something so I don't know what I'm doing next week if you guys have suggestions let me know obviously I'm limited limited on what can I get done in about an hour while talking um let's see but because I've done this so long I can usually look at something and know okay that'll take me about this long versus that one's definitely going to take me three weeks um Patricia said, if you were to push this painting further for a more realistic look, what would you have concentrated on? Interesting details. I would probably clean up some of the details, maybe a little bit more contrast, darken my darks a little, and I'm, I'm probably gonna do that tomorrow when I have fresh eyes. At this point, they're getting blurry, they're tired. Uh, but the, the little details, little um, highlights, I probably would have been a little bit more precise on the petals, making them look more like what the reference photo has. So what I do when I do something fast like this, I pretty much know what can I fill in to make it look good, but not have as much detail, but still look good, just by hitting my values and my lighting right. If I'm gonna spend more time, that's probably where I would spend it on a little bit more with the details, a little bit more with edges and defined lines versus sketchy lines. And the funny thing is, it doesn't necessarily mean it's better, it just means it's different. It just changes the style from being a looser, more painterly look, which is what we have tonight, to something that's more photorealistic. I mean, this is still count, counts as photorealism, but more like, more pushing it further into the realism um, let's see. This is a good question. Michael Perry said, quality is important. If you are just starting out, starting to learn skydiving, do you settle for student grade cheap parachute equipment? Well, what, I mean, to be fair, cheap art supplies aren't going to potentially cause you to crash flaming to the floor. Um, so there's that, it's not as dangerous, but no, you're right as far as, yeah, you, quality makes a difference. Ziga said, hi Lisa, do you have any more changes in opinions compared to the past? Like before you hated the mist sprayers, they weren't bad in the past, or they were bad in the past. Do you recommend to revisit certain things after time passed? Ooh, probably. I'm trying to think. I mean, I used to not be a huge Derwent person. That was when, I mean, after using Derwent Colorsoft, I kind of dismissed them all. But I do like, did like ink tents and now they're one of my favorite pencils. Actually, somebody left a comment recently on my video where I was reviewing some of the Derwent, or I, it was all over my favorite colored pencils. And she went on accusing me of being paid and um, how I'm dishonest because those are crap. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You can see in my, like, heck, these oranges are mostly Derwent light faster the majority of the pencils I'm using. Those and, and, well, I'm using some of all of them, but that's probably the most of what I'm using on that. And she just went off on that. And I'm like, you should try it. Like, it's not the same as Colorsoft. These are not the same pencils. I don't know why that's a confusion. Um, it turned out she had not even used them. So she didn't know. I don't even know why she was insisting they were terrible. She was just assuming everything Derwent was bad. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Actually, the vast majority of what Derwent produces, I do like. Um, so, But that was something that changed my mind because I used to just kind of dismiss them as not a serious brand. And now they're like a top contender when it comes to colored pencils. So, um, And then, of course, they have ink tents, which there's no other medium quite like it. So that also makes them awesome. I can't think of anything else. Um, the Vimus Sprayer was a big one. Um, 
I like watercolor now and I went years where I avoided it and I'm absolutely in love with it now. Um, what else? I'm sure there's more, I just can't think of it. Um, I'll come back to that if I think of anything. I, I'm gonna finish the live stream and it's gonna pop in my head something. Uh, Tessa said, been wanting to say that I love your studio. Thank you, I love it too. AK said, what, the oranges are beautiful. I want to do realistic paintings like that. Do you have any recommendations on what to get started with? Should I read theory or jump in? I love colored pencil, jump in. Theory is going to make very, very, very little sense you are not gonna retain nearly as much of it as you will once you've had some experience drawing. Now, that's not to say your drawings are gonna be any good. They're gonna be terrible. When you start, they're terrible. I was terrible. Everyone's terrible when we start. Don't let that discourage you. But if I read some books on theory now versus let's go back 20 years ago, not just because I'm older, but because I was newer to painting and drawing or 30 years ago, whatever, go back then. I didn't have the experience to understand what theory was talking about. So let's say, and this is like true, let's say you, you're on my Patreon and you're following my lessons where I get more in depth on what I, you know, cause it's like a two hour video versus the shorter ones. And I'm explaining something and you think, ah, that doesn't make sense to me. What are you talking about that the white blends with this in a different way? It doesn't make sense. It will. What doesn't make sense now, don't make it feel like, well, I'm out, this lesson's not for me because I didn't understand one thing. The only reason you're not understanding it is because you don't have the experience yet, you've not ran into that problem. Once you've done a few paintings or drawings and you start running into these problems, when you then go listen to somebody explain why that's happening or you read a tutorial book or theory, that now makes so much more sense because you ran into that problem. You had that happen, you had colors, you mixed those two colors and they got really muddy and you didn't know why. Now when theory explains it, it makes sense. If you just read the theory, you're not gonna retain it because it's not making a ton of sense to you yet jump into the art. There's nothing wrong with reading those books, but there's you're actually going to progress much, much slower than if you just jumped in. Just start painting and drawing. Don't worry so much about the rules, the all of those tips and tricks. None of that is, don't worry about that. Jump in, make some ugly paintings because you're gonna have to make a lot of them. Start making them now, get those out of the way so that they you can go ahead and start progressing. And then if you wanna read those theory books, it's up to you. Some of us do, some of us don't. I don't read a lot. I have read some stuff. I'm just not that super interested in it. I just wanna jump in and make things look good. I just would rather look at a reference photo and go, okay, how do I make that happen? And figure it out. But um, if you do read stuff, like I said, it's gonna make so much more sense to you later once you've had some experience than it would right off the bat. I think people have a tendency to think that they have to do more prep work to get into art than the way they really do. No, you need to pick up a brush, you need to pick up some paint, and you need to, need to go paint some ugly things. That's just a part of the process and you need to do it. Okay. Um, I think you said also what to get, what to get started with. I usually, if you're interested in florals, start with a rose. The reason that I like to start many people off with a rose is you've got, it's not just a flat flower. Like a daisy is actually hard to make look good. It's more simple, so it's harder to make it look good. It's flat and that's not super interesting to look at. Whereas, I mean, like coming from the artist side of creating and like making things look like they're curving and all of that. Whereas a rose has curves, it has folds. You're gonna learn a lot about blending, about shading, about everything. A rose is what I start most students on because there is so much to learn from that. But because it's a rose, you can completely screw up a petal. Not even close to shape right, and it still looks pretty. At the end, you still have a rose that you're proud of. Whereas, let's say you wanted to do people. You start with a person, and it's not so, eh, good job. Everyone's kind of like, yeah, patting you on the back. Yeah, that was really good. But it obviously wasn't, because you're new. Get the hang of creating that three-dimensional look. Get the control of whatever medium, let's say it's paint. Get control of the paint on that rose before you jump into the people. Get control, same thing if it's color or pencil, get control with the pencils on that rose because it is not going to be as discouraging if things don't go quite right as it would be on a person or something like that. So roses are usually what I start people off on. Fish are also really good to get started on because they're, they're you can get a lot of detail, but they're not as like demanding that everything be perfect as some other subjects. Whoops. Uh, okay. Dolphin Soul, can you use ink tense pencils over acrylic? I don't know why you would. I don't think they're gonna stick very well because acrylic is plastic. So you have nothing for that ink tense to stick to. Ink tense doesn't stick to plastic in general very well. So maybe if it was on paper, 
but I can't think of a world in which that's a good idea or you would want to. Like if I do colored pencil over watercolor, it's because colored because ugh, English. It's because colored pencils are so much easier to get clean detail like and clean things up and I can quickly go over that than with watercolor. But there there's no reason like why would doing the reverse makes no sense. Like I don't know why and especially in that case, I don't I can't think of a single reason why I would even want to use ink tents over colored pencil or over acrylics. I would just use acrylics. Um, if I'm mi mixing medium, it's to make my life easier, not more difficult. But in this case, the ink tents aren't gonna stick well to acrylics anyway, unless the acrylics are super thinned out so they're almost like watercolor and on paper, then that will stick. But as far as being archival, I'm really not sure. I don't recommend it. Um, again, acrylics are plastic, so things don't like to stick on top of plastic. Um, let's see. Dalton said, are Gamsol and Mona Lisa odorless paint thinner really the same when you use them with colored pencil? In, in practice, yeah, they feel the same. If you gave me both in two different containers, I could not tell the difference. The only difference is that Gamsol is supposed to be less toxic. It's got a higher flash point. So the Mona Lisa odorless, what I'm using, God, what is the flash point on that? I used to know this. I want to say, and do not quote me on this because I'm telling you right now, I'm getting these numbers wrong, but it was something like uh, the Mona Lisa was like 120 degrees for the flashpoint Fahrenheit, whereas the Mo the Gamsol was like an extra 20 degrees. So it was like 150 or 140 degrees was the flashpoint. The higher flashpoint, the less, something about how it does, I don't remember all the science. It's something about how it's dissolving into the air, or what you're inhaling, and it is just safer. So you want that higher flashpoint. Whereas let's say you're using a paint thinner out of a... Um, which I would never recommend. But let's say you went to a hardware store and got a paint thinner there. It's got a really low flash point. It is extremely toxic. That you really don't want to be breathing in for very long. So that's going to be your your main like noticeable difference is that flash point, which in turn comes in, down to Gamsol is less toxic. By how much? I don't know. It's not by enough that I'm like, getting, I'm going to use the rest of my Mona Lisa odorless, which will probably last me the rest of my life because I've got a gallon, of, like a literal gallon of it, but it lasts a long time. But when I do replace it, just to be safe, I probably will go with Gamsol, but in like how it works on the paper, I can't tell even a little bit of a difference. Okay. Um, Pex's mom said, Lori, it's Lisa. But close. Um, I love your, a lot of people call me Lori too. It's not just you. I love your acrylic style so much, but I would like to learn in watercolor because that is my only medium. Please, thanks, Joy. I will do more. Um, I will definitely do more watercolor, but typically when I do watercolor, it's always watercolor and colored pencil because I love that together. But yes, I like, I, I will do that. Deborah said, do you ever use Neocolor? I was given a large set. No idea. No, I've not used it. I believe that works really well with odorless mineral spirits though. Or wait, was that the one that worked well with water? One, it dissolves with one of the two and I don't remember which. So as you can tell, no, I've got no experience because I don't even know which one you blend it with. Um, Dalton said, have you ever tried gouache? Yes, gouache is just opaque watercolor and it is wonderful to work in and it's one of the things I definitely need to, need to invest in because it's awesome. The shadow illustrator said, have you used a Copic clear blender to blend polychromos or Prisma? So I've not used that, but I have used the markers. Prismacolor made a blending marker. There are two problems with it. One, if you're blending something like a big background, like this one here, this whole thing, I would have used probably three markers to get that level of blending with how many layers I did and to get it to look like that. The other thing is it wouldn't have even been as smooth because the marker, you don't have the same control with a marker as you do with a paintbrush. With a paintbrush, it bends. You get that softness, you know, with, like you saw in the background there. You get a, you can get a very soft look. You can get a fine edge. You can get a soft edge. It depends on, on the brush you're using there and how, how much pressure you're adding. With a marker, you don't have very much control. It, it works great if you're doing more of a cartoony look or if you're going for a very stylized look with these harsher blendings, but it was very impractical price-wise. Like 20 years ago, those were five bucks a piece. I can't even imagine with inflation what that is now and with what Michaels and Hobby Lobby like to charge up the rear for ridiculous prices for their stuff now with no coupon, mind you. Um, no, we're gonna get rid of the coupons so we can bring down our everyday low price. <laughs> Except you didn't do that, did you? Anyway, such like they're, they're both, they're just, mm. um, that's a whole other rant. But you, 
you can't with those, so let's pretend the cost isn't even a factor. You don't have the same level of control. Do they blend? Yes. Do they dissolve that, that pigment into the paper? Yes. But I can't get the softness for that bokeh background. That is not going to be possible with a marker to get that soft. It would be more crisp. My arches, ar my arches, my edges would be more harsh in through here. This softness is just not even possible with a marker blending. So I'm not saying there's never a use for it. And I don't know what the Copics, I'm, I'm talking about the old Prismacolor blenders, but it was so expensive and it didn't even work that well. Nowhere near as well as I spent $30 on a gallon, a literal gallon of my OMS. And I just fill it in this little jar. So the $30 for the OMS, the jar was like Five. I don't know, it seals it. It's got a little airtight thing so it doesn't spill so much. And a paintbrush. And I've been using that same gallon for years. Like that one's probably 10 years old, like about 10 years worth I've gone through and I gave some to some people. So I mean, maybe not full 10 years getting there. But the point is, and I'm not even halfway through it, like it lasts so long. It just doesn't make sense financially or technique wise to go with the markers versus the OMS. Oh, the, oh, let me back that up. It makes sense for travel. So you're going to go and do some plain air drawing and you're, you're sitting at a zoo and you're going to draw and you want to bring a blender. That would be the blender I would go with. That would be the one case that a marker type blender for colored pencil, I think would be really, really good. You go into somebody's house and you just want to bring your, your drawing stuff with you. But if you're doing a serious project, a serious painting with your colored pencils, then I would go with the OMS and the brush. Okay. Am I caught up? I think I'm caught up. And it is 10.02, so we are done. The, if my work went, yep, the auction is over. Congratulations to the winner of that one. I will get that shipped out this weekend, so it'll be early next week it actually goes out. And the Dan the Lion will be going at the same time. And thank you guys so much for joining. Thank you to the moderators for helping. My gosh, I could not do this without them. Check out their channels. Links are in the video description. My supplies, everything that I'm using is in the video description as well. Um, yes, and if you're going to be in the Dallas area, May 20th through 21st, I will be at Aquashella. Come chat with me. I'm going to have some prints, mostly marine stuff. I'll have some chiclets with me that you can't get anywhere else. It's the only time I sell those or only place I sell those. So, and it's a fun aquarium. It's got fresh water, salt water. It's got reptiles and plants and like, it just, it's a fun event to walk around, even if you don't want to actually buy fish. But thank you guys again for joining and I will see you next week. Let me know what you hope to see in upcoming lessons. Bye. Uh, maybe bye, because I don't know how to hit buttons. There we go. Yeah.